Okay, so I have my vector type design. In order to get it to work at the resolution I need for my, my poster, and I'm making my poster with my spot illustration, if I check the image size, it is in inches, a 12.38 by 7.77 inches by 300, because I want my poster to be at least 9 by 12 inches at 300 pixels per inch. So I need the type to work at that resolution. And I need at least a thousand pixels, you know, like a large format. But I'm going to go even bigger than that because as a vector, it can out be outputted to any raster size I want. So instead of hitting selection, because that seemed to give me a blank one at the end of the last video, I'm just going to keep it at the page and I'm going to keep it as a PNG. But instead of only 640 pixels, which is just screen resolution, 72 pixels per inch. So not even 10 inches wide at screen resolution. I want something like 3000 pixels, which allows me to go 10 inches wide at full printing, right? Because 300 pixels per inch is print quality resolution. And so 3000 pixels allows it to go 10 inches at print quality. But I'm a little worried about all that extra space around it, so I might even go to 6,000 pixels. And because the, uh, the artboard that's around it is a square, it's automatically doing it as a square. So I'll try to do 6,000 for both sides. Okay. And I guess it has an outer limit of that. So now I say download. And it's going to be 4,961 pixels. So you make it as large as you can out of just the vector.com program. It's going to be untitled number three. I'll see it in my downloads. Here it is. And that's a PNG. So I'm going to bring that into assignment eight. This is why we have so many different files and assets for assignment eight. Mark it with yellow. It's an asset I'm going to use for my type. Then I can go to my photo P and I've already merged this so that it takes up a little less memory because we're working at high resolutions here. And then I drag and drop that PNG in. And that brings it in as a smart object that is big enough that I can scale it down and place it. And because it's a smart object, it won't me it won't let me erase from it but it will still let me stretch it and rotate it and work with it. So that's the placement I want. I hit return. There it is. Very good. Now I want to do the same with anxiety. And I've already saved it out as a PNG in the same way. The difference is my anxiety one, before I hit return and place it, has to be rotated 180 degrees. It is above the resolution I need, because if it were below the resolution I would need, I could still make it fit, but then it would be really soft. So there it is, it fits. Nice. So now I've got my black type solution, just like that. And if you want, you can save that just as is. And I'm just going to export it as a, a JPEG.
And I'll check my downloads and there it is. I can bring that into assignment eight as well. That's just because that's the first thing you're going to turn in, that you're required to turn in, is your black type. So I'll call this assignment eight, black text. Now, just like the SVGs that we saved out from, from Vector, there's a lot of empty space around it, and I don't need all of that. So I can, I can use PhotoP if I want just to modify that JPEG, or I'm just going to use the built-in program in a Mac preview and just crop it down. You use Command-K as a short for crop, shortcut for cropping within preview. And this is at the resolution I need it to be for my poster, but because my type is quite small, it doesn't take much zooming in to see the problems with that. But that is my black type solution. And I know I have the vectors to back it up. So I'll be the first thing I upload. So I'm gonna mark that, let's see, with, let's do blue. All right. Now, because I have these two smart layers, what I can do is add color to them. And the safest way to do that is to duplicate them. So I can select them both and then hit Command J. And I'll turn off the black ones behind. And I could relabel these, you know, black type if I wanted to. And then to play with the coloring, I'm simply going to use layer styles. So I don't want plague to be solid black. What do I want it to be? I think I want it to be kind of a yellowish golden color. So I'm going to go to color overlay. I'm going to pick the color. I can actually steal it right from my image. I kind of like that creamy yellow. So that's good. What else do I want? This is just like coloring your logo. Well, I want some border around it so it stands out. So when I squint, it's still very readable. And especially because I have a lot of variety in the coloring behind it, that's important. So I'm going to give it a stroke. And that stroke color, yeah, red's not bad. Or I could try maybe like a really dark blue. Maybe I can steal the color again from my my pixels there already. I'll give it maybe a little bit more color than that. There we go. Then I can play with whether the stroke is on the outside or on the inside. Because if it's on the outside, it's going to grow the type. But if it's on the inside, it's going to make the type look a little bit tinier. I can split the difference by saying center, which centers it on the edge. And that looks pretty good. But I think I have the space. Yeah, I think I'll do center. Yeah, that looks good. And then I can play with how many pixels it is, right? So this does affect your the readability if you if you do a stroke around it. Okay, next I have all this cool texture and duotone coloring. So that flat color is kind of boring. So instead of just the flat color, I'm going to take it down in opacity to about 50% or maybe 60%. And then behind it, I'm going to put a gradient, a soft edge duotone. And so I can do that with any of the gradients under the gradient overlay. And I could do full spectrum, you know, have more colors involved, have more of a duotone like that. I can use one of their, their built-ins all these different options, right? But I don't want the type to overshadow what I've already created. And of course, I can always customize these colors. It just depends how much time and patience you have for all of this graphic design decision making. So any, whoops, 
anytime you have a color selector, you can select from any pixels within the raster based program. You don't have to use the color picker. Yeah, so I think, oh, it didn't do it. Darn it. <laughs> Did all that work? And then I didn't hit OK. But it's OK. It's teaching you. You have to pay attention to each step when you do this stuff. You have to hit OK for the color selection and then OK for the gradient. All right, so now I have that. So what it is, is it? It's a solid kind of light color on the top that allows, takes the opacity down and allows that gradient to come through underneath. And that just kind of modulates it a little bit, the, uh, the color overlay at 58%. Now I can add a drop shadow if I want it to stand out even more. The drop shadow is set to multiply, multiply, which will darken everything below it, which is helpful. I could also set it to normal and just play with its opacity. Right, so you can make it a solid, solid color drop shadow as well. And then you can play with the distance it has from your type and how hard edged or soft edged it is. And that's with size. So by shrinking the size, it means it will be a sharper, sharper edge drop shadow. And then you can change the direction of it with this angle. And if you use global, if you have that checked, that means every time you do something like embossing or inner shadow, drop shadow on anything, like when I deal with anxiety, it will match the same angle. So it has kind of a global light source. And that can be really helpful. And then I like to play with this noise feature. It's a little bit like dissolve. It just breaks it up a little bit. So it doesn't look so digital. Okay. And then, of course, you can pick the color. So this is just using black. But if I wanted to use like a, a dark brown, it's a little reddish, I can put that in as well. Okay, then the last thing you might play with, and you can play with the others and see, like maybe you want an inner glow. You can play with those settings and its size. That's kind of nice, especially with the noise. There's, so there's lots of things you can still play with. But if I'm really looking at it, the Professor? light, yeah. Is there a way to get a brush to effectively work as a glow effect? To get so a brush to work as a glow effect? If you could take it, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How else to say it. yeah, so remember how we did overlay layers? If I create a new layer, just a new blank layer, and I'll do it with a uh, middle gray, So I'm going to, you know, brush with just my brush tool, but then I'm going to select it because it's hard to select perfect middle gray. And then I'm going to say edit fill with gray. So that's a perfect middle gray. And then I set it to what's called an overlay layer. You'll see how it just disappears entirely, but, the, but it's still there. So then I'm going to deselect. Okay, so now I have this blank layer because it's set to overlay mode. But if I right click on that and I add an outer glow or an inner glow to it, because that is lighter, and I can do this with shadows as well. You know, the inner glow is lighter than 50% gray. The drop shadow is darker. I can basically turn my brush into an effects brush. So anywhere I paint now on this layer, because it has those effects turned on, it will add those effects to wherever I touch. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So that's, that's a nice 
a nice way to use effects in kind of a hand 